Hello, I'm Debbie Doyle from the American Historical Association. Thank you for attending Teaching the Medieval as Mediterranean, Reorienting the Meta Narrative, which is part of the AHA Colloquium series of Virtual AHA. We're excited to have you join us and are looking forward to a productive discussion. I would like to thank our generous sponsors, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Stanton Foundation, the History Channel, and Oxford University Press. You can support virtual AHA and other AHA activities by joining the association or, if you're already a member, making a donation today. We'll post links with details in the chat at the end of our conversation today. A few logistical things to cover before we start the webinar. By registering for or participating in the AHA's webinars, participants and panelists agree to abide by the AHA's Code of Professional Conduct. Please use the Q&A function to submit questions to the presenters. We hope to address all relevant questions, but need to be mindful of the time, so we may paraphrase or combine questions. If you'd like to be a part of the conversation on social media, remember to use the virtual AHA hashtag. Finally, a quick reminder that this webinar is being recorded and we'll share the recording on the AHA YouTube channel. I'll now turn things over to the chair of today's session, Kenneth Baxter-Wolf from Pomona College. Thank you. Thank you very much, Debbie. Welcome everybody to Teaching the Medieval as Mediterranean, Reorienting the Meta Narrative. I'm delighted to be a part of this panel, though I had absolutely nothing to do with creating it. Its subject is very much in line with my own approach to the Middle Ages as it's evolved over a 36 year and counting career at Pomona College. When I was hired in 1985, I inherited a medieval European survey that I dutifully taught for the first five years before the history department at Pomona decided to globalize its curriculum and create these new co-equal continentally focused subfields. There was one on Asia, Africa, Latin America, Europe, and North America. <clears throat> but after these five teams were picked, so to speak, out of the existing members of the department, only the ancient historian and I were left standing there on the sideline. And so I suggested that maybe the two of us should join forces and form our own subfield called Ancient Medieval Mediterranean. Unlike the others, it would be focused not on a continent, but on a sea where the three continents met and it would be the only subfield with a specifically pre-modern time frame. All of the others were simply continents and generally speaking, lean toward the modern period. My ancient colleague had no problem at all with this suggestion. He could basically go on teaching what he'd always thought, the ancient Mediterranean. I, on the other hand, was forced to adjust the traditional geography of my subfield to make it less European and more Mediterranean. That meant incorporating heavy doses of Byzantine and Islamic history into my new survey course the medieval Mediterranean. The process of reframing my own teaching geography this way was the first step toward my creation in 2012 of a new program at the Claremont Colleges called LAMS, Late Antique Medieval Studies, one that was not to be housed in history, but in classics. Like classics, LAMS would be Mediterranean-based, multidisciplinary, and grounded in language. The only differences Lambs would begin with Constantine where classics typically left off and Lambs would add Arabic to Greek and Latin as a foundational language. Since we started it in 2012, Lambs has not only insulated medieval history at the Claremont Colleges from accusations of Eurocentrism, but it has preserved the medieval history FTE from being recycled for other purposes in a history department that's not only global, but increasingly modern in its orientation. And I would add to this discussion the importance of maintaining pre-modern studies against a kind of an assault by the modernization of the curriculum as, as jobs and FTEs begin to kind of collapse. One might think that reframing medieval studies to make it more like classics would be like throwing an anchor to someone in need of a life jacket. But in fact, classics has much to offer medieval studies in terms of its multidisciplinarity, the value it places on language, the language of its sources, and of course, its Mediterranean ride geography. All that to say, I, I'm delighted to be here and I hail the publication of this new groundbreaking textbook. I only wish that it had been available in 1990 when I started doing this. So let's begin the round table. Um, there are three big questions or prompts pertaining to the Mediterraneanization, that's a tough one to say, of medieval studies that we've employed to focus the conversation. So what I'm going to do is read each prompt and then I'm gonna ask the panelists, two of them, to respond to that prompt. So there's three prompts and six panelists. 
uh, when we've worked through the three prompts and the six responses, then I'll open the floor to questions from the audience for as long as we have time uh, to do so. You would just simply type your question into the question feature, the Q&A feature, and we'll respond to them as we get them, sometimes combining them, et cetera, et cetera. You should be able to see the questions and the answers um, so that should somebody join later, they'll, be, they'll know what's actually gone on. To see full position positions on these different points by each of the panelists, you would simply uh, follow the link that's in chat that will give you a biography of the panelists as well, because I won't, I won't take time to do that. Uh, and you'll notice that each name of the panelist is, is, there's a bio, and then at the end of that name, you'll see position paper. And if you click on that, then you'll be able to see fully what it is that, uh, that they have to say, even though they're going to confine their oral comments to about five minutes or so. So let's begin then. The very first question, which I'm going to direct to Thomas Berman from Notre Dame and Claire Gilbert of St. Louis University, um, more of a prompt than a question. The logistical challenges of teaching a course on the medieval Mediterranean are, are many, given that few of us are trained to do it all, as in the whole Mediterranean, we inevitably find ourselves teaching out of field. How do we manage that? And given that there is so much material and so little time to present it, how do we condense it in ways that still give our students a meaningful sense of the whole? Um, uh, yes, thank you, Ken. Um, this is a question that, that uh, I've thought about for a lot of my career because I started out not 36 years ago, but 30 years ago about uh, teaching first uh, Western civilization for a number of years and then world history. Uh, for a number of years, um, and it, 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 the same question comes up, I think, as, as Brian pointed out in his position paper uh, in those courses and in an even bigger way. And I've always adopted uh, the, uh, the philosophy that, that, um, that uh, I saw articulated, not by a great historian, but by a forgotten uh, comedian, uh, George Goebel. There are probably aren't many people uh, at, at this session, uh, maybe Fred, um, who, uh, who can remember George Goebel. Uh, I can barely remember him. Uh, he was a comedian in the 50s and the 60s, uh, and he had various shticks, but one of his shticks was he would bring out a guitar and he'd start off playing a song and then he'd get um, um, uh, d disoriented or he he'd think of something that he wanted to say and he'd stop and he'd you know he'd he'd uh, he deliver a few one-liners and then he'd go back to playing again and then part of the shtick was um he would be playing the song and there were clearly parts he didn't know very well and he was having a real hard time getting those to work right um but then he'd come to a part that he really knew well and he'd play it beautifully and at that point, he would stop and say, I play the heck out of the parts I know. And, and then you go back to playing. And, and that's always been how I've thought about teaching these big sur uh, survey courses, is you play the, the heck out of the parts you know. Um, and by that, I don't mean just teaching what you do know, in my case, uh, sort of European and I I Iberian and, and, and Western Mediterranean Islamic history, but rather, um, um, that you uh, play up the, the broader specialty that, or specialties you bring to the course. And, and in my case, these have always been intellectual and religious and cultural history. And the fact that, that I feel comfortable talking about intellectual history of Iberia, uh, both Christian and Muslim, makes it a lot easier for me to find ways to uh, engage with Byzantium, uh, and the rest of the Islamic world, on the level of intellectual cultural history. Um, and it's not that I don't, that, that's not that I leave out um, political history or social history or economic history. I, I, I try to give students uh, a pretty good uh, uh, background in those areas, but I build the themes of the course around the parts I know. I play the heck out of the parts uh, I know. And that helps me have a principle of selection of uh, when I'm gonna talk about Byzantium, uh, I'm much more likely to talk about the Hesychast uh, controversy at some point than I am about whatever the, the complicated palace politics of, of uh, Constantinople. 
So uh, that's my credo, play the heck out of the parts you know. Thanks, Tom. Um, so I'm probably going to be uh, echoing uh, some of Tom's uh, Tom's um, uh, initiatives here uh, because when I was thinking about the questions of the logistics that we were asked all asked to think about for this panel, and then also reading everybody's papers, uh, I noticed that we all seem to really highlight this question of choice and the importance of of our own choice when we're trying to create a course that's intellectually coherent for ourselves and for you know, thus for our students. So I want to borrow actually one of Tom's ideas from his paper, which is that each course reflects each scholar, right? So you're playing the heck out of, of what you know. Uh, and I think that this actually uh, can be an invitation to students, uh, not only into the topic of the class, but also into, um, you know, the our, our profession or the, the, you know, the kind of inquiry that we do as teachers and as scholars. So I think being really upfront with the students and discussing with them this kind of inescapable fact of the choice that we make as history teachers uh, can also sort of introduce the fact that all historical narratives are the product of choice uh, and then you know perhaps even declining more many historical uh, you know events and phenomena uh, you know there is also some element of um, uh, choice and what we focus on uh, in how we and how we uh, talk about it or even how the people at the time who were generating the sources that we might rely on uh, are also uh, representing it to us. So uh, in my paper, I kind of tackled this question of choice uh, with uh, a not very original solution, which is to uh, really lean on the question format uh, in order both to introduce course topics, but also to remind students just right from the get go that historians ask questions. Uh, so to design the survey around kind of big questions, of course, you know, the questions that I feel that I am equipped in some way to answer, uh, but that can also give us kind of a thumb uh, target. Um, so uh, the other thing that I really want to emphasize with students uh, through this kind of question or organization by question method um, is that we're inviting them into a conversation that is changing over time and that our practice is also dynamic. The historical practice is also dynamic. Uh, and I think that teaching the medieval Mediterranean is really a prime opportunity for exactly this kind of an invitation to students. Um, you know, the other thing that I noticed when I was reading through all of our papers is kind of a common uh, thread is that a lot of us also emphasize the importance of comparison. And this, I think, is also speaks to the logistical concerns of organizing a survey. How do you choose what to compare? Uh, and if comparison or a comparative method is uh, a, a common strategy for managing a survey, uh, and especially for the Mediterranean. Um, you know, it seems especially well suited to the medieval Mediterranean, which is, of course, as we all know, a nexus for Afro-Eurasian interactions, transmissions, uh, and comparison in this field can help us in crafting those historical questions that I was just uh, suggesting, um, and of course, help us choose which ones we want to we want to ask. Uh, so once we've helped students to locate the appropriate evidence from which they can make meaningful comparisons, and here perhaps authors of the textbook might have. Um, you know, might offer us some insight about how they selected the sources for the source reader, for example. Uh, but once we've helped students, you know, locate the, the evidence from which to make meaningful comparisons, we can also start helping them seek evidence for connection behind those comparisons, or perhaps there, there's not a, a connection. We can also ask them to speak, uh, speak about that phenomenon. And we also might ask them to look at evidence that calls into question the very categories upon which our comparisons are based. So there are a number of dyads that are presented across the position papers um, that I'm just going to mention as an invitation for the audience to, to go and look at the papers, Christian Muslim, Greek Phoenician, uh, a location versus an area, Latin Byzantine, a believer versus an unbeliever, uh, certainly in my own experience, and I think of others here, uh, medieval Renaissance, uh, boundaries between language, law, and religion, a comparison of ideas and texts as they're being transmitted over time. Uh, so once we have armed the students with this kind of critical reappraisal, um, we can also ask them to reflect critically on the categories with which they are themselves approaching history. Uh, and I think that we might find, and I was, I was really struck by Brian Catlis's point uh, in his position paper, I think we might find that our assumptions about their categories might not be quite what um, 
uh, might not be quite on target. And so I think that this kind of conversation by a constant interrogation, constant question, uh, questioning could be a really uh, you know, meaningful way of structuring the course. So you know, to conclude, um, you know, it might seem that leaving the students with questions rather than answers is not the goal of an introductory survey, but I would argue on the contrary, um, that anticipating ending our time together with questions rather than answers, it might make everybody uncomfortable. In fact, in my experience, it definitely has made everybody uncomfortable. The students are uncomfortable, the instructor is uncomfortable, um, but it can become really exciting as students discover that they have permission to um, explore topics, more selected topics, selected by me or selected by them more deeply. They can take ownership of those ideas. Uh, and for instructors, we have permission to help them into the process of inquiry rather than ensuring that they master this impossibly broad set of facts. So uh, I think that that um, is actually a, a goal to uh, aim towards, at least it is in my case, um, that uh, rather than a, a great mastery over a set of uninterrogated answers that they would end up with better questions. Um, so thank you. I, I've touched on a few of the questions of revisionism and presentism. I couldn't help myself after these stimulating papers, um, but I'm looking forward to this conversation and hearing from the other panelists and, of course, the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Tom and Claire. Moving on to the second prompt, this would be directed to Brian Catlos of the University of Colorado and Fred Astrin of San Francisco State. The revisionism inherent in such a course, a medieval Mediterranean course, may be lost on students who come with comparatively little previous exposure to the subject. Is it important that our students understand how medieval studies used to operate before it redefined itself as a Mediterranean field? And do we need to teach some of the canon so that we can teach against it? Okay, I guess I'm up first uh, out, of, uh, out of this pair. Thanks, uh, thanks Ken for... Uh, for uh, your work uh, organizing and introducing the panel. Well, I've, I've posted my position paper on, uh, on the website that you all have access to. So I'm gonna keep my comments as short as possible so that we can get on to the more interactive part of the panel. And I would just say that, you know, in my experience, I, you know, we, we go through a, a, a process, I think, particularly those of us who are more towards the, uh, the, the, the senior scholar side of things where the whole development of uh, the, this subfield or this approach of Mediterranean studies involved dismantling, uh, you know, a narrative that we have been taught. And, you know, you carry with that experience the assumption that, that other people need to go through that process as well. And, uh, you know, one thing uh, that, uh, has become clear to me is that uh, you know we can't assume that other people need to go through that experience and for me I guess most graphically that's been illustrated to me by the fact that I have children and the assumptions that, that, that I make about their experience often turn out to be completely wrong and when I started teaching Mediterranean courses I you know I kind of felt that I would have to teach this 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 kind of wrong uh, uh, narrative in order to take it apart and what I found was it, it, you know, by and large, it just wasn't necessary in most cases. You know, the, our students today uh, grow up and live in a world very different from the one that, that we grew up in. And, uh, you know, the, the categories that they imagine and the way that they see society and culture on an intuitive level, I think, is very different from the way that we did. And when I, when I present the, this Mediterranean world of, of uh, cultural, ethnic, and religious diversity, of, of ambiguity, uh, I don't have to belabor it very much because uh, for many of them, it's, it's the world that they live in and, and, and they recognize it easily. Now, to a certain extent, that might, ex that might depend on your student constituency and which type of institution uh, you teach in and, and what the, uh, the sort of the, the, the culture is uh, from which the students emerge in their in their previous education or their or their family background or their religious background. So, you know, I think in terms of in terms of sort of rather than dismantling things, what uh, I think is important is, and this came up in some of the other position papers as well, such as Fred's, is you know, get them to think about the categories that we use. Uh, you know, east, west. Uh, uh, progress, uh, religion, 
and get them talking about them and thinking about them uh, early on in the course as a sort of prelude uh, to then, uh, you know, then diving into the material. But uh, what really I, I found refreshing was, was how ready students today seem to be uh, to take this approach and how natural it seems to them. So I'll leave it there and uh, that's it. Well, I don't agree, which is to say, uh, I think the revisionism, though I don't like the name, and in my paper, I call it recentering, I think has a useful purpose. It has a personal usefulness for me because uh, I'm excited about it. And when my excitement can be uh, visible, students pick up on that. And so I think that helps. And secondly, though I don't do it in the systematic way uh, that one might think, which is to set up a straw man to tear down, I do use it along the way and it elicits uh, student curiosity when they hear about the way, well, when, when they compare what we're doing in the class with the way I'm describing uh, the way something had been done before. And it can be a mnemonic for them as well so that students can, uh, they can uh, remember something uh, that is part of the course material through that portal or through that instrumentality of the professor comparing it to the way things had been done in the past or the way things are done in one discipline as opposed to another discipline, uh, uh, that, that kind of thing. I, I wanna specify, at least for me, that I'm talking about teaching the survey of medieval Mediterranean history to distinguish that from a different project that many people uh, are involved with. And that would be a course in medieval Mediterranean studies that is a subject uh, that is um, uh, less than a, a whole survey. That is to say uh, X in the Mediterranean in a certain period. And that I, I think there are different problems when we go into it uh, this way. Um, and this reflects Horton and Purcell's distinction in The Corrupting Sea. This really, if anyone doesn't know, this really important book uh, behind a lot of what we're doing, this distinction that Horton and Purcell make between history of the Mediterranean and history in the Mediterranean. And so when we're doing a survey course, we're really, whether we're doing it consciously or not, we're trying to come to grips with a history of the Mediterranean in a way that uh, a course on um, the Venetians in a certain period, the Ottomans in a certain period, et cetera, uh, isn't necessarily directly engaged in. Uh, this recentering, I think uh, has been very, it's been a liberation for me in my own research. And so I wanna, I wanna give that to the students. Uh, and I will confine my remarks to that so we can move forward. Thanks. Very good. Thank you, Brian and Fred. Moving on to number three, the third prompt is, how should instructors navigate the presentist concerns that such a course is likely to inspire in its students, given its increased attention to ethnic religious relations, colonialism, et cetera? How do we productively address these concerns without succumbing to anachronism or teleology? Is a course focused on the medieval Mediterranean any less of a civics lesson than the traditional medieval survey focused on Europe? And this question uh, then is being directed to Mark Meyerson from the University of Toronto and Maita Green Mercalo from, from Rutgers. Um, thanks, Ken, and hello, everybody. Um, I, I will be brief. Um, when it comes to students' presidents, presentist concerns, uh, I embrace them. I'm, I'm really glad they have them. Whether uh, I'm teaching Mediterranean history or my big course on the global history of violence from prehistory to the present, um, I find that students' presentist concerns uh, really give the courses a kind of wonderful uh, intensity. And I guess I should point out that 
I teach at the University of Toronto, which is one of the most ethically diverse universities in the world. Um, and so at a certain level, teaching these kinds of courses, um, Mediterranean history in particular, can be a bit uh, of a minefield. Um, but at the same time, it's really energizing. And it's been my experience, sometimes despite my uh, expectations that students are uh, remarkably uh, respectful of each other and their own uh, different uh, political uh, opinions, religious backgrounds, uh, and the like. Um, that said, you know, anachronism and teleology uh, really are uh, a challenge. And so at the beginning of the course, you know, I always insist um, that in order to make the medieval past useful and productive uh, for the students, they really have to deal with medieval folks uh, on their own terms, uh, you know, um, from their own perspective, trying to get into the heads of medieval people, um, understand their own worldview. So when students veer towards uh, anachronism and teleology, and of course, you know, they often do in discussions or in their essays, um, it becomes a really teachable moment, uh, really productive. Because um, then we end up, you know, pausing and saying, hey, you know, let's think about this. Let's look more closely at the sources. What are these people, you know, really saying? Or let's look at the context. So what, are you gonna do? what do we really know about these people in terms of their social and religious backgrounds, the political system in which they're operating, the economic strains in which they're, uh, under which they're operating and so forth and so on. So they really, um, you know, can try and put themselves uh, in the medieval context. So I find that these president, president's concerns, as I put it, as I, as I pointed out in my, my comments, it becomes a kind of, creates a kind of dialectical sort of uh, discussion at a certain level between um, past and present, but most usefully it forces the students to really, you know, immerse themselves into, in, you know, in the medieval context, if they're going to sort of really make the past uh, productive. Um, as for teleology in particular, I find that um, when it comes to the medieval Mediterranean, students often find Mediterranean societies, Christian, Muslim, Jewish relations, and all that's involved uh, so surprising, so destabilizing, um, that it, it challenges any expectations they kind of had. It challenges, it upends any kind of narrative, you know, they came to the course with. And so, in, in, you know, as we go along, I find that teleology is less, is less, less of an issue. There's no obvious, you know, end point, uh, Um, direction. Of course, when I'm lecturing, when I'm, you know, framing the course, of course, I do give it a kind of uh, direction. But again, it's so, it so much boils down to context because things, you know, in the medieval Mediterranean are often so uh, surprising. And one of the really exciting things about, you know, hanging out with Mediterraneanists over the years, and, and thanks to Brian and company for the medieval seminar and all the Mediterranean seminar, is that you know, every, you know, the sheer richness of the field, I'm constantly surprised, constantly having to rethink, you know, my understanding of any kind of, uh, you know, teleological or any kind of, you know, master um, narrative. Um, and as for the civics lesson, um, you know, I think as Tom suggested in his comments, I think in a way teaching the Mediterranean is a bit more uh, of a civics lesson, or at least, you know, it enables students uh, to really grapple with, um, you know, these questions that are of great meaning to them of, you know, ethnic and religious difference of, you know, the construction uh, of race, of, you know, the origins of enslavement, or at least it's, it's different uh, divergences that it took in the, uh, in the medieval Mediterranean, or, you know, one of the really wonderful things I like to do is, you know, sort of comparative 
uh, gender history and you know the, the operations of you know patriarchy and these different societies and how that all uh, plays out. Um, but really, I I love the presentist concerns of the students, and I'm just you know I'm I'm thrilled that they come you know with these interests and uh, you know I, you know I, I make I make the best of them and uh, you know the Mediterranean like even when I'm teaching the history of violence at a certain level it's the fulcrum of the course because there's so much going on in that medieval Mediterranean that looks backwards that looks that looks forward you know in different different and exciting ways so yeah it's wonderful thank you thanks Mark for for your um comments on this. I want to address this question by focusing on a course that I am teaching this semester. And it's a course that I came to um, a few years ago. I was asked to write a, a chapter on uh, ethnic, ethnic groups in Renaissance Spain. And, um, and before I did that, I decided to, to try to teach a course on race, ethnicity, and uh, religion in the uh, pre-modern Mediterranean. And I've continued to teach this course and I keep changing it. Um, one of the things that I like to do in this course, um, and I, I really appreciated, Mark, what you were saying about taking seriously and, and uh, having students delve into what medieval people thought in or study them in their own terms. I kind of take a different uh, approach um, because I want students to, on the one hand, engage with uh, recent scholarly debates and critical race uh, studies in the pre-modern world, which I think is uh, something that uh, is, is really important right now. And um, then we also look at uh, or examine how these ideas developed in, um, in the pre-modern Mediterranean, focusing on the construction and deployment of uh, discourses of racialization, of religious difference in sort of these processes of imperial formation, political consolidation, et cetera. Um, so I'm kind of move my students between uh, the scholarship the what is what was happening at the time, but I also have to face uh, the problem of kind of um, trying to gain a common language uh, when talking about race. So I begin the course, uh, and and this is good for the students. I teach uh, at Rutgers Newark, which is also one of the most diverse campuses in the U.S. And so I kind of try to invite students to consider their own ideas and attitudes about race and ethnicity. Um, and also at the same time, how the construction and the deployment of these categories are playing out in modern political and social discourses. So we try to do many things in this course at once and sometimes it works better and sometimes it doesn't. But the first couple of weeks we dedicate to a discussion of what is race. And um, I find, I try to uh, um, give students the work of sociologists, legal scholars, historians, I, Barbara Fields, try to clarify what race is and what is not. And um, I have to basically uh, show students how race is uh, a social construct. Most of them come to the classroom with an understanding of race as a bi biological fact. So we have to kind of get through that first. And, um, and so then we, once we've sort of really tackled this issue of modern, concepts of race, then we can sort of st start looking at the pre-modern period and uh, what the pre-modern period is not like the, the modern period. And that's a good exercise. Um, when, we, when I teach this, for me, uh, one of the things in this course uh, that I try to do is by presenting different uh, examples, we cover uh, Jews, Moriscos, um, uh, all sorts of different uh, groups and different categories and examples is that I don't want um, to uh, take as a given that there was such a, a thing as, I mean, that we can actually talk about race in the pre-modern world, but I want them actually to make up their minds and discover as they are uh, studying uh, the, the, the material. And so I think this is a really productive uh, course for an institution to teach at an institution like Rutgers Newark, because we have a very diverse student body. In fact, 
this semester I'm teaching the course. I, I first taught the course at the University of Michigan and most of my uh, students, except for one African -Amer American student were white. And so their ideas of race were, were uh, really um, interesting. And then I have these other students, I have everything but white students in my class this semester. And, and it's a very important uh, subject, I think, to bring uh, up in, in my classes, because one of the things that we see in, in a campus like mine is that students are kind of siloed in their own ethnic and religious communities. And this kind of uh, course is, is very eye-opening and important for them. Um, and they can relate in, in really interesting ways and challenge the way that they think of things. But I want to um, end by thinking beyond the uh, questions of anachronism and teleology and focus perhaps on the issue of activism in scholarship and uh, take it seriously and when we teach and why students are, are taking our courses or a course like mine um, and to think about what are the merits and possibly the pitfalls of uh, of activism in, in teaching and in scholarship and of this current presentist kind of turn uh, to deal with questions of race, et cetera. Um, because I, 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 this is a question that I've kind of really been thinking about lately and I hope that we can also talk about together. Thank you, that's wonderful. I am uh, now inclined to go ahead and uh, open up the floor to questions, which basically means that I turn, of course, to the list of questions that's been accumulating and uh, pose them to the, to the panelists uh, and then ask the panelists to, to raise their little, their little electronic hands um, if they are inclined to want to, to address that particular question, okay? So uh, the first one um, from uh, Glenn Cooper, whom I actually know quite well, he's right. He actually can, quote, handle most of all the medieval Mediterranean himself. He's a very rare uh, person that way in all of his languages and all of his experience. So his question is, how can I convince my school to let me offer a course with this kind of coverage, the kind that we're talking about, when they tend to prefer, prefer the regional or period approach? I wonder if any of our panelists have run into any difficulties at all in terms of designing their courses, if perhaps they're operating under some pre-existing structure. I see that further down, uh, we have um, another um, a question or comment from Catherine Pearl um, talking about uh, asking for advice for part-time part junior faculty who are assigned to courses with preset titles like Western Civ, though uh, her particular question is to what extent if we're given a title like that uh, should we should we then do something to to uh, deal with the old narrative etc cetera, etc cetera. so why don't we start with uh, with claire um and then and then tom and then brian so just uh i'm gonna be quick because i i'm interested in the answers to these questions also but i just wanted to share that my experience um so far uh really echoes what both claire and glenn uh, are bringing up. And I think that it's really fundamental that we also consider and bring into the conversation the different institutional contexts. So, at, you know, as Maite and Mark and, and others uh, have also done, um, I think that there, there's a lot of material for arguing for the value of, um, you know, the Mediterranean as a kind of unit, you know, a spatial and a temporal unit that you might be able to kind of translate to the other expectations. That's for Glenn. Um, for Claire, I would say I have solved this problem myself. And I'm, as I say this, I know this is going up on YouTube, but I've solved this problem myself uh, by trying to kind of insert as many Mediterranean materials as I can into the broader surveys. And then, like I said, in my initial comments, you know, telling the students why I'm doing that and why I think it's a good idea for them to do this with me, but you're trying to also ensure that they know that's not the the end of the story thanks and tom i believe you were next uh, yes uh, thank you i'll just say a few a, a few things uh one suggestion for the first question is and, and this depends on your institution but i, I think one pathway into persuading a, a history department to offer to allow you to offer a course on the medieval Mediterranean is, is to, you know, ask, uh, it looks like you're offering a course on, on the Atlantic world, 
uh, in the in the early modern period, and uh, uh, and if they're doing that, which they may well um, say this is this is a very analogous pro uh, project. This is doing much of the same stuff. In fact, it actually grew out of Mediterranean studies. So I think that that Atlanticist turn um, that is really showing up in a lot of teaching is an entree to uh, um, helping a department uh, see the value of a Mediterranean course. And to uh, Kate Pearl, whom I know very well, um, what I would say is that from the very beginning of uh, when I was teaching Western civilization a long time ago at the University of Tennessee, I just built an enormous amount of Islamic history right, in, right into it. Um, I didn't do the same with Byzantium because I didn't feel as comfortable with it, but I just sort of, and I didn't ask anybody's permission. It's, it's just that's the way I taught the course that uh, understanding Islamic history was fundamental uh, to understanding the, the history of the West. Um, and so I, you know, I think you can usually, um, uh, you know, you, you give a, the, the course has a title, but normally faculty members have a great deal of leeway to, to um, adapt as, as they want. Um, so you can give that a try. Yeah, the problem comes when there's a textbook assigned, but hopefully we can get this uh, textbook assigned and then everything will be fine. So yeah, yeah, that, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Brian. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I've had the I've had the good fortune both at the University of California and University of Colorado to be able to you know basically come up with the courses that I want. So you know anything I say should be taken with a with a with a grain of salt. Uh, but uh, you know one argument that you can make, I think, uh, which uh, administrators and departments uh, uh, chairs may understand, is the argument uh, of efficiency. In other words, you know a Mediterranean course can can, can serve as a, as a precursor or a survey course, which then leads on to courses in, uh, you know, uh, Islamic history, uh, European history, or what have you. So, you know, give that a shot, uh, the, the efficiency argument. Uh, you know, the, the problem of having to teach Western civilization, now that's one that I like, because, you know, really what, you know, one of the sort of, uh, uh, you know, main thrusts of Mediterranean studies, at least the way we've been kind of developing it in the Mediterranean seminar is that it, it implies a reconsideration of what the West is. So if, if your West is Western Europe, uh, you know, I would suggest your West needs adjusting. And uh, for, for us, really, in, in my view, you know, the book that, we, that, we've, that we've come up with, the sea in the middle is really, in my view, a Western Civ book in that, you know, this is, a, this is a West that stretches, one hates to put boundaries on things, but we can say in the Middle Ages that stress, that stretches more or less from the Indus River uh, to the Atlantic. And from, uh, you know, uh, by the time we get to the 13th century, from, uh, you know, the Niger River thereabouts uh, up to the Baltic. And I think, you know, this is one of the most important, uh, you know, things about the, the approach, I think, is that it, it invites us to uh, consider the process of the creation of the West as something which involves, you know, all of these different uh, African, uh, West Asian, European peoples and cultures and, and, and religions. And that the, the end product is not merely, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the Anglo Western European West, but this broader uh, uh, Western culture, which includes, you know, uh, Islamic culture, uh, uh, you know, Jewish culture, uh, uh, African uh, culture, and and uh, you know, at least West Asian culture for sure. So, you know, I think that's a, that's kind of an opening that they that they're that they're giving you that maybe you can you can step into and you can say yes, this is the West, but you know, the real West, not this little corner of the West that 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 we believe stands in for it, or which is the, the sort of uh, natural end point of, of some historical process. And just, just to throw in before I, before I acknowledge um, Fred and give him a chance to, I just wanted to say my own teaching, the only teaching I've done before I got to Pomona was a year at the Western Culture Program in Stanford as essentially a grad student uh, TA. 
Um, but I had the pleasure of working there with Sabina McCormick and also with, uh, with Joel Bynan, who did uh, modern uh, Egyptian history. And we, we um, decentered back then the whole idea of medieval studies by bringing Islam fully into the picture, just as we brought uh, the kind of Hebrew world as a counterbalance to, to the ancient Greeks, let's say, in the first of those. And then we did kind of modern uh, modern Europe versus the, the, um, the uh, uh, colonized world in imperialism, et cetera. And these were all kind of seemed pretty new at the time, but I left when I came to, to Pomona, I had with me a sense of how to handle essentially a Western Civ course that just like Brian described had, it, it was inconceivable to take Islam out of that and try to figure out how Thomas Aquinas got his hands on Aristotle, right? It just didn't work. Um, and it was a bit of a shock for some of my colleagues, and it lit, did lead to a little bit of a rough, rocky uh, road for me as we tried all of us in teaching Western Civ in those days, my first years, to more or less be on the same page, and we just weren't because some were very much focused on Europe, and, and there I was trying to, trying to bring Islam into the picture. But anyway, Fred. I think one of the arguments to make if you're trying to convince a department or administrators to Institute of Medieval Mediterranean uh, survey is to tell them they're going to get good enrollments. I mean, purely the practical matter here. And then, of course, the other feature of kind of uh, institutionalism is that is an approach that I took when I established my course, and that is have it fulfill requirements. And so my course actually fulfills a global history requirement. That's different than world history. Uh, don't ask me, you need to ask some administrators at my institution. Um, it also fulfills a requirement for environmental history uh, because of the, the monocultures, the, the mono agricultures, uh, the, the effects on the environment that we can trace when we look at uh, medieval Mediterranean history. Uh, also, you can argue that this is a trend, which is to say, anyone you want to convince, have them look at the website of the Mediterranean Seminar, have them look at the syllabi for courses that are posted there so that they can see there's something going on in the academy of, uh, and, this, and your institution needs to be, needs to be part, of, part of this. And then I, I really like the comment about, the, about uh, Atlantic studies. And of course we can say the same perhaps about Central Asian studies uh, and, and others. One of the ways I frame my course is as a handoff to my colleague in the history department. I'm in the Department of Jewish Studies, so in fact, I did have to convince a history department to, to institute this course. But I, I kind of hand off my course to my colleague, uh, Sarah Crabtree, who teaches a course on uh, world maritime history in the post-medieval period. And so uh, I, I actually lecture at the beginning of her semester and she lectures at the end of my semester, my term in the course. And so that we create a kind of a continuity within our department, well, within our university uh, between the narratives of the medieval Mediterranean and the narratives that she's going to develop in talking about Atlantic and global maritime history. I'm looking now at another couple of questions that are quite different, um, but related. I think Maite had it. I'm sorry. I, I was hoping to chime oh, in really, oh, um, yeah. really quickly. Um, yeah. I actually have a different uh, experience than everyone else teaching uh, Western civilization. I was hired, I was trained as an Islamicist and hired uh, in my department as an Islamicist. And I try and I teach the survey of Islamic civilization every semester. And I try to teach Islamic civilization as Mediterranean, uh, history of Islamic civilization as Mediterranean history, because most of my students are uh, Muslim students. And for them, it's very valuable to see the connections uh, and not stay in the central Islamic lands, but also, but actually uh, move further uh, west. In most of their uh, courses on Islamic civilization, they end up never really studying Iberia and Al Andalus. And so I think doing a Mediterranean, having a Mediterranean approach uh, to a course like Islamic civilization uh, is also uh, very valuable, at least for me. I just wanted to say that. 
uh, two of the questions relate to the whole idea of medieval Mediterranean, and that is the word medieval and then the focus on Mediterranean. So David Peterson, where does the medieval North see its epicenter linking uh, Galicia to Ireland, Northern Gaul, Scandinavia, and Russia fit into this paradigm? Is it relegated back to the periphery? Um, presumably it was kind of peripheral in some sense, the old conceptions of medieval Europe, and now maybe even more so, I'm, I'm adding words there. And then um, Jack Owens writes, what is medieval middle about the history of the Mediterranean over seven to nine centuries involved? The term disorients students and not in profitable ways. I wonder if the panelists would respond to either one of those, a kind of a temporal challenge and a, and a geographic challenge to the conception of the medieval studies that we're talking about. Brian. Sorry, muted, not used to Zoom. Uh, so I'll, I'll stick my neck out and, and try answering uh, the first question. And, you know, where the center is of your story really depends on what questions you're asking. And it's not necessarily a case of privileging any one, uh, one area over another. But I think, you know, when you're looking at, and again, uh, at least, you know, when I was, when I work on larger questions of Mediterranean studies, and, and certainly when, you know, my role in, in writing this book that we, we wrote, this is really a book about the big picture. And uh, when you're looking at the big picture, you naturally have to have to privilege, you know, the, 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 the processes that, that have what you see as having the most impact on, 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 on what you're looking at. And this is really the, the, the very simple reason why I think, and I'm gonna use the term medieval, why it's useful and natural to recenter uh, the, the larger Mediterranean narrative or the larger medieval narrative on the Mediterranean, because in, in terms of the sort of the, the, the processes uh, of innovation, be they cultural, techno technological, uh, institutional, uh, etc., uh, it it really seems that the you know most of most of what's happening uh, or the most dramatic changes that are happening in in many senses, at least until you know probably the period of the Black Death, are really happening as a consequence of that engagement in in the Mediterranean. And this isn't to 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 say that anything else that's happening on the on the periphery. And again, periphery is a, just a, a question of where you decide to focus as as uh, uh, you know, Sharon Kinoshita says, you know, where the foot of your compass is. And uh, so, uh, you know, it it, it 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 shouldn't be threatening. <laughs> the Mediterranean narrative shouldn't be taken as a as a as a as, uh, uh, as, as implying that, that any other processes are, 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 are less important or less interesting. It's just a matter of what, what questions you wanna answer. And I think it's really useful to, to, to look at the Mediterranean if you're talking about those larger uh, cultural, institutional, uh, political processes that are, that are happening through most of this period. And then you know, later, you know, Northern Europe arguably becomes you know, in, in a lot of these ways more of a center or, or uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, Persia, perhaps. Uh, but again, it's, uh, it's not a zero sum game. It's, it, it's a matter of, uh, you know, what you want to address, and then choosing a way into it. Um, yeah, I don't have um, any great insight about this. Uh, but I'm, I, I will say that um, it's an issue that's come up at, at my own current institution. Uh, I'm the director of the medieval institute. And uh, Notre Dame has has almost certainly uh, well uh, the largest collection of medievalists uh, in the United States, uh, similar to in size in terms of faculty to the collection at Toronto. So we have people working on all this stuff, uh, and in fact, we have uh, for a while we had kind of uh, cornered the market on Old North specialists. Um, and uh, people working on the on the you know elaborate, complicated relationship between um, old Irish texts and and old Norse texts and and uh, medieval Welsh texts, all that kind of stuff. 
Um, my desire as director is to keep that going. Uh, I really want that to keep going. But the Institute has also become a, a big center for Mediterranean studies. And I don't think that the one excludes the other, but I do think if, um, if you wanna focus on these issues that, uh, that I think really draw in students and I think are uh, a part of just that um, our students need to hear about, which is yes, for a thousand years, um, Jews, Christians and Muslims live side by side in the Mediterranean um, and a great deal of that living side by side was relatively peaceful. Some of it was, was quite hostile and ugly, um, but we have a living laboratory of, of pluralism in the, in the Mediterranean. I, I think it, 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 it's a unique opportunity to teach that kind of material. And when you choose to make that your focus uh, and you put, your, put down the foot of your compass down in the, in the Mediterranean, I'm a that the North Sea nexus does um, become a peripheral one, but there's no reason that um, that uh, another course um, for another purpose can't focus on the North Sea because that, that set of connections is fascinating. Um, I, I personally uh, don't really understand um, the concern about using medieval uh, in, in the title. Um, I think uh, the question I read it um, mentioned that uh, this scholar had first begun doing this in 1972. I think um, the, um, the uh, meanings of medieval have changed a lot since then. And a, a lot of, uh, there was a time when medieval just meant medieval Europe. But um, for most of my life as a scholar, uh, going back to graduate school, um, it was so interesting to me to see how uh, Islamic historians were happy to talk about a medieval Islamic period. I had a brilliant uh, Japanese historian in my, in my department at Tennessee, and he insisted on talking about medieval Japan. Um, I, so I don't, I don't see it as a, a, as a, as a term that is problematic uh, myself. I'll stop there. Claire? Yeah, just to chime in on the on the medieval question, I just wanted to offer you know, maybe, maybe a, an idea. This this has worked for me um, because I think it's just never too early to initiate students into um, the question of both history and historiography. You know, maybe not uh, you know a full course on historiography, but at least having be, making them aware that there's this distinction between the past and the way the past is represented. So that includes uh, periodization, right? Uh, so I think, um, you know, uh, thinking historically and historiographically about why we use the term medieval for a class like that, I think that could actually be um, a, a really uh, valuable discussion for a first day of class, for example. Very good. I, uh, yes, Mark. I mean, I would just add when it comes to Mediterranean history that in terms of what's understood as medieval and the kind of chronologies that are used, um, you know, historians of, of, of Judaism and historians of Islam, you know, often have, you know, different, different chronologies in terms of what, what constitutes that, that middle period. And so I think, you know, doing the Mediterranean where one is dealing, you know, with Christian Muslim Jewish relations, there is that kind of um, flexibility. And I find it very difficult actually to know where to draw um, the line. But when I teach the Mediterranean survey, my medieval Mediterranean really goes uh, until the end of, of the 17th century. Um, because I just find certain certain problems are uh, certain issues, certain developments are more clearly, uh, I suppose, worked out uh, in a way that say they're not by 1500. Um, and uh, just throwing onto that, I, I basically keep going till I run out of time and I never seem to get past the 14th century. So that's just, just how it is. That's probably because I start focusing so much earlier. Um, I do a lot, for instance, with what I call Socratic and Abrahamic traditions coming together. So our first, you know, our first 
our first focus is you know Philo of Alexandria, right? And and uh, and our last one is is really um, Ibn Khaldun. And so, you know, we use that to frame uh, you know what was a traditional medieval European course, very much medieval Mediterranean, focused on primary sources. You know, you're you're once you decide on a theme like that, you're kind of forced to begin with with people like Philo and 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 with you know the Marsilio of Padua's and the and the Ibn Khaldun's and, and you just run out of time. There's no reason why I couldn't go if they would just give me more time or if my students had that kind of stamina. Um, I want to acknowledge um, a couple of the of the uh, Q and A's that are more that are more comments and suggestions. Um, one from uh, Clara Farrago I developed and taught a planetary approach to the history of art that sounds very similar to what we're discussing here. I agree with Brian that giving students the narrative we have been taught is not productive. It's the biggest mistake uh, I made with the large foundation course at the intro level. Just teach the new material the new way and watch them grow. Um, uh, and, and I think that's that's consistent with a lot of what we're what we're hearing here. It is true that generationally we're moving to a position where we're not going to have to speak against the counter narrative for much longer. We will we'll have to provide it if we're going to, and and that is a lot of work and it takes time. Um, and then I'm I'm looking at uh, Marie Kelleher's um, thank you to the panelists. She uh, is focused on uh, she teaches uh, her course on ancient medieval within a more of a broader world history field and asks the panelists if they've thought about world history uh, as a bigger picture for what they're doing and whether world history approaches have influenced their approach to, uh, to Mediterranean, medieval Mediterranean studies. Um, that is a paraphrase. It sounds like Tom, you you may have. Were you the men, one who mentioned talking doing world history at Tennessee as well as? Yeah, yeah, I I I I, I taught world history for off and on for about ten years, and it, it took it took a long time to, of course, to gel. I have to confess, um, but um, yeah, I, I I think I've been very influenced by that experience in teaching the medieval Mediterranean. Um, I used, uh, when I taught uh, world history, um, the, one of the earliest um, world history textbooks written from the ground up, as opposed to all the ones that were Western Civ textbooks that then they added some stuff to, a bunch of those. This was the one by Bentley and uh, Jerry Bentley and uh, mm -hmm. um, can't think of the other guy's name, called Traditions and Encounters. Um, and those two notions that uh, what, what this textbook explored, explored was the development of what it called traditions, cultural traditions, religious traditions, and then what happened when they came into encounters with each other really fit my interests as a scholar uh, to start with. Um, and um, they shaped uh, that course entirely. And in a case, um, um, my course on the medieval Mediterranean is, uh, it's, uh, has a lot of that quality about it, uh, the, its traditions and encounters um, between them. Uh, so I, uh, yeah, I think there's a real productive kind of way uh, in which M Mediterranean history is, um, is global history um, on, a small, on a smaller scale, uh, world history on a smaller scale. Brian? Yeah, I was just going to say uh, as well that uh, I think that teaching world history uh, many years ago also kind of prepared me for, for tackling the Mediterranean. And, you know, I, I think world history is a, is a great frame to it. Again, it just depends what you're trying to do. Uh, you know, you can't do everything all the time and what sorts of questions you, you want to ask. And I really see that the, the, the medieval Mediterranean course and approaches as, you know, looking, you know, specifically at the, at the development of this, of this, uh, this wider West. And like uh, Linda Darling sent a, a comment uh, to us via the chat. And, you know, again, this is not about, this is not about limiting things. And uh, over the years, as we ran the Mediterranean seminar, people would ask Sharon and I, Sharon Kinoshita, who's the co-director of the Mediterranean seminar and myself, where does the Mediterranean end? 
And well, it depends on what questions you're asking. It's sort of, you know, it, it, it trails off into Central Asia and South Asia, the Indian Ocean and, and, and Africa and Northern Europe and, and, and the Baltic. So, uh, uh, you know, depending on where you want to go with it, uh, you know, it could turn into a, a medieval uh, a world history type of course or part of the world history. But, uh, you know, that's we're sort of providing the, a, a framework for, for you to use as a, a, as a launching pad for, for, for where you want to take it, really. Yes, Mark. Well, I've never actually taught world history, but I do teach this global history of violence um, from prehistory to the present. And I call it histories of violence. And um, so I'm choosing particular histories to enable the students to dig into particular uh, contexts. And this certainly informs the way that I teach Mediterranean history, or maybe the way I teach Mediterranean history is informed my histories of violence course, which is to say that you know, each week as we're dealing with different themes, you know, we focus on particular areas, particular uh, examples, you know, and as the other panelists are suggesting, this can take one, you know, beyond the Mediterranean at times, but to just have, you know, two or three really excellent examples. And the, the examples vary, uh, you know, each week, depending on the topic, it really does give the students, you know, a very broad range of the Mediterranean and other, you know, potential connections, you know, with with the wider world, depending on how, how, how one does it. But, um, so, yeah. Thank you. Um, Catherine Rayerson writes, uh, much of the expertise on this panel is Iberian, understandable given the fact that Spain incarnates much of what we think about in addressing the medieval Mediterranean. How do you integrate the perspectives of Italy, Southern France, North Africa um, to remain just in the Western basin into your teaching? So question, I suppose, again, about going back to our original questions about how we cover it all. And uh, when you have an expertise in, in one place, and uh, as Tom says, you, uh, you, you play that well. Um, what, about, what about the other, the other parts of the Mediterranean that way? Um, I saw a hand, Did, was that Mark? Oh no, I see Fred, go right ahead. No? Sorry. Oh, okay. One of the issues is uh, what kind of readings are available for students. And so there is, in terms of what's written in English and what's appropriate for giving to students, uh, does create limitations on incorporating certain topics and certain areas into the course. And, and some of them are harder than others. Uh, and just the, the, the structural predispositions, the term I used in, in my position paper of the old disciplines and the old area studies that we, uh, from whom we've inherited have meant that sometimes there's not a good reading for a subject we'd like to bring in, we'd like to incorporate. I think in general, uh, it's much easier to find material on uh, the West the old I, the old notion of the West. Uh, um, I liked it was Tom. Tom had this wonderful term: uh, England, Fran England dash France dash Germany dash North Italy plus Crusades. So there's a lot more on that in English and available for students than for from the Islamic side of things. I was trained in Near Eastern studies, so I'm coming to it uh, not from uh, not the Iberian side, but uh, from the East, so to speak. And, and uh, th th this is uh, one of the big challenges, simply what's available. And this is one of the reasons why this LAMS program uh, in the Claremont Colleges, why the focus is so much on language, um, not just Latin and Greek, which we in kind of inherit from classics, but, but we add Arabic to that. And in fact, we recognize um, Hebrew and Syriac as well. We just don't regularly offer those languages. And so it's more of a challenge, um, but we are producing uh, graduate students who are going to places and and uh, and working in Arabic, and my hope is that the the more of those we have, the more um, the more we will see translations of sources in those fields. I'm a big fan of translation. There's only so many languages I can handle um, comfortably that way, 
and uh, and and the goal of Lambs is not to replicate myself, but to replicate a better version of myself that that actually handles uh, handles these kinds of things. A new hire at Scripps College, uh, who is a real polyglot when it comes to language and focuses on Christianity up to the time of Islam, has really helped us out a lot, and he's regularly offering some students on the way to graduate school some Syriac lessons. So that's just a great a great addition. Any other responses to? that question or query, I think sources is big in all of this. And I have to say, when I first started my first course on medieval Spain as a graduate student in the early 80s, just finding stuff uh, in English that I could share with the students, I mean, that has changed so dramatically in the last uh, almost 40 years. I think we're gonna see that same kind of thing uh, in, in the whole literal of the Mediterranean that way over time. Fred? I wanna add one more thing. Uh, besides acknowledging the questioner, uh, Catherine Ryerson, my teacher, um, the, we uh, in our institutions need to give people tenure for doing a translation. We, we, cannot, in, we cannot downgrade this as a academic project. And I think that, I think we've started to turn in that direction, but so often someone who wanted to do a, an annotated uh, a uh, translation of an important text might have been told, well, that's that's great, but do that after you have tenure. And I think that the Academy has made a big mistake uh, when it, it takes that attitude. Mm -hmm. Claire? Oh, just, uh, just to kind of join this conversation, yes, I, I agree wholeheartedly with what Fred has just said. And also because we are discussing this at the American Historical Association, you know, I think that there are a number of themes that we are touching on, which really uh, connect to a lot of the broader issues in our discipline and of course in the academy. And I just wanna say that the one thing I find really inspiring about this conversation is, you know, the, the, these questions that we're asking one another, we can also ask our students. And of course they're at the beginning of their journey, but we can invite them into the conversation. And if we do that, you know, we, we are creating room for them with us which also creates, you know, an, on, an enduring place for these questions in the future. Um, and so, certainly, you know, as Fred was saying, there's a there's a lot of um, you know, there's a lot of work to be done, especially with translations and 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 making students aware of the excitement and the promise of that future work. I think it is something really exciting about this conversation. Thanks, Tom. I was simply going to say that, um, yes, I was originally trained as an Iberianist, although I was never really comfortable um, with that uh, as a descriptor of the kind of work I did. Um, I later found out that my late predecessor at Notre Dame, uh, Olivia Remy Constable, um, preferred always uh, to call herself a Mediterraneanist rather than an Iberianist. That, and, um, and I, I guess I feel that way, uh, but I also wanted to make the point, and I think Remy would have agreed with this, that um, while you know my my all, my initial work uh, was on Spain, and a, a lot of my work has been connected with Spain, that work has brought me all over the Mediterranean, um, uh, uh, re research-wise. So. Um, in my, my earlier work on uh, Arabic, Arabic speaking Christians in Spain, I wound up having to learn all kinds of stuff about the Eastern Christian communities because it turns out the Arabs in Spain uh, were getting a lot of ideas and reading a lot of texts that originated among Melkites and, and, um, and Miaphysites and, and others living in the Islamic world. So uh, I think one of the ways um, that I have it helped me feel more comfortable um, in teaching much more broadly than than Iberia is my research has brought me there. But I also think, um, uh, and this is true of, of the three of us, I think who uh, wrote this uh, textbook, we very intentionally um, made ourselves um, uh, include great ge geographical breadth um, various ways. Um, and so uh, in the opening vignettes of chapters um, uh, of the, the ones primarily uh, um, um, uh, the author of, uh, I had one of uh, Sadia Gaon in Baghdad, uh, 
one with Alfonso X uh, in Spain, um, one with uh, Nasir ad-Din uh, Tusi, uh, the great astronomer um, in, well, really in uh, far uh, Western Iran, and one with Pico um, in, in, in Italy. So we, I think I, I speak for the three of us, we made ourselves uh, make sure that this wasn't Iberia plus a little bit more stuff um, in the Mediterranean. My turn. Um, I, I want to go back to I, I appreciate what Tom what Tom was just saying going thematically, but also what Claire was saying in the beginning of looking at doing comparative history and also perhaps com connected histories and presenting those connections. I mean, I also work in Iberia, but my work has taken me to uh, deal with the Ottoman Empire, to deal with Sicily, to deal with uh, France, with, uh, of course, the Saudis. And so I think there are ways in which we can deliberately present the material either thematically or by looking at specific connections that allows us to get outside of our very particular uh, uh, area in which we study. And uh, But it is true that the question of sources is a real problem. So until we keep working on that, we're always going to encounter these problems. It's sort of a uh, God closing a door, opening a window kind of a thing. When you think about the, the whole Spain focus, um, how important that's been for getting people who might otherwise, let's say, have had careers focused on uh, north of the Pyrenees. Um, I was not trained to do south of the Pyrenees. I just happened to pick a dissertation topic that that sort of never let go to me, go of me while I was doing that and other things. But I wonder if someday somebody will look back and they will say, yeah, back then, okay, there were so many Iberianists who were determining how we talked about, let's say, Mediterranean history. Um, we owe them a great debt and, and we also have moved beyond them. And now we truly are teaching things in a more egalitarian way. Maybe, I don't know, but, but I, there are a lot of Iberianists because when I was hired, for instance, at Pomona, I was hired in spite of my Spain focus. Um, they wanted somebody who did, you know, French feudalism. They didn't want any of the other imperfect feudalisms represented. And that, that idea is now so far gone. Um, if, you, if you don't do Spain anymore, have some contact with the Mediterranean, it seems like you're going to have a hard time getting jobs where you are expected to step in as the kind of pseudo uh, Middle East person um, that they that they didn't replace, by the way, uh, when that person retired. So the the way Iberianists are kind of dominating the conversation is is a reflection of of, um, of hiring practices as well that are, that have been very interesting. I wanted to leave time at the end, even though it means I'm going to leave a lot of a lot of stuff on the table here, a lot of really good observations and questions. Um, so that the authors of the book could talk a little bit about what what kind what what this book looks like, uh, what's in it, um, and maybe some of the decisions that you made in in writing the book. What makes makes it different than other books? Let's say aside from that kind of uh, specific Mediterranean focus, um, we didn't talk about this, but I think it's a great a great suggestion, and it might also in the process help answer some of the questions that remain that remain unanswered. Brian, you want to take the lead on that? Yeah, I can start. If I can share my screen, what I propose to do is we have, uh, the book is still in progress. We're in the, the final stages, but I can screen share uh, the, the working table of contents of the textbook and the reader. And I'll try to run through those in just uh, uh, just a couple minutes. And then uh, maybe Tom and Mark can, can, can jump in and, and uh, add some uh, color commentary as it were. So hopefully I have, uh, permission to share. Let's see if this is the one that I want to share first. Uh, can everyone see that? Yes. Okay. So again, just to, to run through it very quickly, you know, we really decided to build a narrative uh, from the ground up rather than, uh, you know, take the uh, creaky old narrative of, of uh, European medieval history and kind of add more bits to it. And that involved uh, playing with the, the typical chronologies a little bit. So you can see that the book stretches from 650 to uh, 1650, more or less. And the book is broken up into three uh, larger parts. What we thought really uh, marked major changes in the sort of nature of the history of, of this, this West that we're looking at, and which incidentally do happen to align, haha, with. Uh, with uh, changes in the environment and climate. 
uh, no coincidence. So let me just run quickly through those and, and, and you'll get an idea of where we're coming from. So really it begins with uh, the Heleno Islamic Mediterranean. And we begin by looking at uh, the sort of uh, the, uh, the, the Imperial Caliphal Age when uh, with the expansion of, uh, of Islam across the Mediterranean uh, and the establishment of the caliphates and the sort of uh, robust and sometimes not so robust periods of uh, Byzantine history and the emergence of uh, you know, the Frankish Empire in, uh, in, in Western Europe. So uh, one thing to, to comment on also is you'll see that each of our chapters uh, contains things called artifacts. And unlike most uh, textbooks, which give you the text and then have a few illustrative uh, documents at the end, we really wanted to flip it over because we uh, flip it around because we wanted people thinking about the, the building blocks of history. And we didn't limit ourselves to documents, which is why we call these artifacts. Often they're uh, visual images, sometimes they're buildings, objects, sometimes there's a, a series of objects or texts which are set off against each other and which invite the students to start thinking about the themes we want to explore in each chapter. So the book kind of has a, has a, has a, has a chronological progression, but not a strict chronological progression in that each chapter is, uh, contains thematic elements sometimes which are limited to the period under discussion, but particularly towards the end of the book in part three, we have thematic chapters that address the whole stretch of, of the period. So just to run through, you can see we start with uh, talking about empires, uh, Mediterranean uh, connections and conversion and the consolidation of identities and learned culture, people of the book, reading their books. And this brings us to the next period. And our next ma major period is 1050 to 1350, the sort of contested Mediterranean, right? And this, this, uh, this era in which uh, we have the peripheral peoples, you might say, uh, uh, taking a more robust role uh, in, in, in the narrative as the, uh, as the as the, as the previous hegemonic structures sort of begin to crumple, uh, the caliphates, the uh, Byzantine Empire, uh, et cetera. So we look at, at met the Mediterranean from the edges, uh, the idea of a connected sea, travel and trade takes a, a, a strong role here. The diversity of Mediterranean societies and what the implications of that were. And again, learned culture, engagement uh, of uh, people of different traditions with each other's learned culture and of course, technology, science, and philosophy. And finally, we get to uh, the final part, which is 1350 to 1650, again, post Black Death, decline of the medieval optimum and all of the crises that accompanied that. And uh, here the book takes a little bit more of a thematic turn in that some of the chapters, again, look back over the whole stretch of, uh, of the history. So you can see uh, imperial rivalry and sectarian strife, minorities and diasporas, slavery and captivity, mystical messiahs and converts, humists and armorers, family, gender and honor, and finally, uh, Mediterranean economies and societies in a wide, widening world, which kind of lays the, the foundations for the you know expansion of this West beyond uh, uh, the sea. And its hinterland. So we were really trying to balance, you know, as we went through the book, balance chronology with thematics and with coverage, both in a geographic sense and in in a in a thematic sense. And uh, you know, so we made a real effort, for example, not to have you know one chapter on women's history. You know, there is a chapter which focuses on gender, but you'll see gender running through the book as well. Uh, and that was kind of a, a challenging uh, balance to strike. And I'll just take a minute more just to show you the, the uh, TOC for the, uh, for the texts so you'll get an idea. And it was the same, a similar thing. We really tried to choose texts that, that uh, in one sense provided coverage and that we wanted the various uh, uh, cultures, perspectives, and themes represented. 
And what we often did was in the documentary sections, we went for short excerpts, which students seem to like more, and often put them side by side with uh, similar or contrasting sources from, from other uh, cultural or religious or, or, or geographic uh, areas so that uh, students are invited not just to think of the sources uh, 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 as, as sources in themselves, but to, to set them against uh, other sources that may be similar or which address uh, similar uh, themes or subjects or, or dilemmas and so on and so forth. And I'm sorry for running through this so quickly and I'll stop now, but I'm going to update the web page uh, of, uh, of today's session with a link to the recorded, the AHA recording, and I'll also post these TOCs so that people can get a better idea of what the book is about. So we've only got a few minutes left, so I'm going to stop there and let, let Mark and Tom jump in uh, with anything they want to add to my hasty overview. Don't be shy. Mark, jump right in. Okay. I don't have much to add to uh, what Brian said. He gave a very good overview. Um, as you can imagine, um, covering the Mediterranean in the different chapters was, uh, you know, quite difficult um, for two reasons. One, rather like the source problem we've talked about, uh, some regions, some peoples, etc., have um, received more, you know, scholarly coverage, you know, than others. So as much as one would like to, to uh, give more coverage to certain areas, it just uh, wasn't possible. Um, moreover, as you might imagine, we've all been there. Um, there is the issue, you know, of length. So, you know, we had to economize and not be able to, um, and sometimes we weren't able to do all we would have liked, uh, you know, in each, in each chapter. But, um, yeah, as, as Tom was saying, you know, with our opening vignettes, I think, kind of tell the story in terms of the range uh, of regions and, uh, and peoples and, and, and issues we've uh, we tried to grapple with so that it, it really is not um, in any sense, you know, a kind of an Iberianist uh, take on things. Um, as far as the Med Western Mediterranean goes, um, I think compared to the way a lot of Islamic history is written, uh, I think we did try um, to give more attention to uh, the Maghreb and, and, and Ifriqiya than you know, is often given in the standard uh, Islamic history narrative. So I think it's, at that level, our slightly you know, Western, uh, you know, Andalusi, uh, Maghrebi orientation um, is, is, is one of the strengths uh, of the book. I'll stop there and give, I wanna give Tom some time to um, I, I just wanted to point out uh, that, yeah, the, the, the textbook is organized chronologically and thematically, and usually the first chapter of each of the three parts, I think in all cases, um, focuses more on the political chronology and in that kind of traditional sense. And then the other uh, chapters within that part are, are rather more thematic and um, and that means that some things are, um, are covered um, um, in, a, in a period when you would think, well, they don't, this doesn't happen just then. So uh, a chapter I wrote in the third part that deals with mystics, well, there are mystics throughout the whole of Mediterranean history, but we decided to focus on mysticism in that last chapter. And I, I go back and, and sort of build in some of that background but um, at that, that's another characteristic that the book, the book has. Um, Good. Our, uh, our time is really limited, but I just wanted to uh, point out something that uh, Brian indicated in the chat. Um, and that is that there will be announcements set out um, on the Mediterranean seminar mailing list when the page is uploaded with et cetera. I assume that means that when they go to the the uh, website that they'll be able to um, connect to Mediterranean Seminar and continue to be able then to receive uh, what is a, a remarkable list of programs uh, all, all around the world and all around the year. Um, it's a wonderful thing to see those. Even if I don't attend as many of them as I would like to, it's wonderful to know that they're out there. It makes me feel like a part of a, a very important whole that's really reframing uh, the way that we think about these things. 
I apologize to everyone whose question was not addressed. I hope that it was addressed somewhat indirectly at some point with my, my uh, un untrained efforts at trying to piece these things together and present them to the panelists. Um, I just want to thank them all for letting me be a part of this. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful experience. It's great to see faces I haven't seen for a while. Um, and I thank everybody who's attended um, for your attention to what we consider to be a really important matter, not really just about medieval Mediterranean history, but about history and its role uh, today and how important it is to continue that study and to keep shaping it in accordance with, with, with really who we are right now. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Uh, just before we go, I'd like to thank once more time our sponsors, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Stanton Foundation, the History Channel, and Oxford University Press, and also a special thanks to everyone who participated in our discussion and to the panelists today. Have a great day. Thank you.